Hey, I am Professor Matt Chapman with Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, and I'm here today to talk to you about observational drawing. Uh, observational drawing, pretty simply, just means taking what you see and uh, translating it to a, a surface, whether that be through drawing, painting, sculpture, you can even sculpt from observation. Uh, but it's really just you making connection with an object and working from it. Uh, so a couple things that we see a lot, and it can sometimes be tricky, like what is observational and what is not. Uh, and a good example of something that is not observational would be if you set up an, a still life or you set up an object and you took a photo of it and then you worked from that photo. Uh, or you found, like you had the idea that you wanted to draw an object, so you go online and you find that object, a photo of it, uh, and you work from that photo. You are uh, still making a great drawing and that can be really helpful, but it doesn't quite qualify as observational. Uh, so observational drawing, again, really just comes down to you and an object. Setting it down, you know, you'll have your sketchbook or you'll have your surface here and you can draw from it and it's just you and the object. So, uh, there are a couple different kinds of observational drawing though, and some of them can be pretty straightforward, some of them can be just a little bit more abstract, and some can be pretty fun. Um, you know, in addition to objects and things that you have around your home or things that you find out, uh, you can actually draw from people. So, this is an example of observational drawing, but these are quick gesture drawings. Uh, you know, this one, five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, really quick, you can get a friend or a family member, or you know, if, you're, if you have access to a live model drawing, absolutely observational and really a ton of fun to draw from. Maybe a little bit weirder, blind contour drawing. Uh, well, what's really fun about a blind contour drawing, if you haven't done one, uh, is you set up your object and you draw from it without looking at your paper. Uh, so, you know, for example, I would set this bottle up and if I were doing a blind contour drawing, I'd have my pencil and I would hold it over here and just let my eyes kind of follow the object and my hand try to capture uh, what my eyes are seeing. At the end of it, you come up with this crazy looking uh, <laughs> kind of mess of drawings, but it's really fun. Um, the idea is that they end up looking crazy, so if it looks a little weird, a little wonky, it doesn't matter. It's a blind contour drawing. You can always say, I wasn't even looking at it when I drew it. Uh, but this is really fun, and it still counts as observational drawing. Probably the most recognized form of observational drawing comes in the form of a still life. Uh, still life, we are setting up a variety of objects and we are giving it a really good strong light source and we're drawing directly from it. Some of them, you know, you focus on just one object or others will try to do the whole thing. Uh, still life painting, still life drawing has been around for centuries and uh, it's, it's a well-aged practice of observational drawing and still today it proves to be a really, really valuable source. Uh, so with still life, um, I'm going to talk to you about setting up a good still life and uh, maybe a couple things to avoid when setting up a still life. So let's get to it. Uh, let's take a look at uh, setting up a still life that maybe wouldn't be as successful. Uh, so I have a couple objects here. All right, so these objects may all be fun by themselves, and they might be really interesting by themselves. Together, they have the power to be interesting, uh, but set up just like this, maybe not as much. Uh, so, you know, when I look for a good still life drawing, I'm looking for something that's got some space, I'm looking for something that's got depth, uh, maybe even something that has height, and uh, I, I like to see something where the objects are a little bit varied. Uh, so, for example, all of these objects, they're all about the same height. And uh, being this tight together, it makes them really hard to be able to appreciate these guys here in the back, particularly this bottle, which is a little smaller than all the others. I would imagine it would all get lost back here. Uh, so even if we were to kind of spread these things out a little bit, it might make it a little bit better, uh, but it's all the same kind of uniformity in the height uh, and this kind of you know, really bland, flat background. Um, this can be helpful if you're just trying to draw, you know, maybe one of these things. Uh, you get a pretty decent shadow, you can only pay attention to its form. 
Um, having a flat background can be great when you're just trying to work with one object, but when we're working with still life, it usually has a, a, more than one. So bringing all these things back together, I think might just be a little boring. Uh, but why don't we get into something that would make a really exciting still life? So I'm gonna kind of clear these off. All right, so an exciting still life has a couple things. Uh, I mentioned just a moment ago that height can be a big one. So if you have a cardboard box, you've got something that can build height. Just an empty cardboard mailer, and I imagine we all have access to a towel or a sheet or a blanket or something. So just by throwing this down, we're already creating more interest because now we have these beautiful fabric folds. Fabric in itself can be a really, really fun thing to draw. Also, it counts as observational drawing. So I like to kind of square this up so we really appreciate that this has like a level to it and you can kind of play with the technique with the cloth. And then let's bring in some interesting objects. So I have this really cool sheep skull. Bring this in. What else have we got? We have this little antelope. A uh, tea box. I like it because it opens and it's got some really cool uh, text on it. It has a neat design. So maybe I'll put this up front since it's a little smaller. Flowers. If you have access to uh, plants, flowers, leaves, um, whether they're live or fake, fake or nice because they never, they never wilt on you and they always keep their color. These can be a really great addition because it just adds a little bit uh, like a, of a variety. An organic shape like this can really go a long way in a still life. So let's bring these out and I like this guy for some color and I like this for its height and I like to put things on different angles too not everything is straight on I think you know changing up the angles it keeps interest going uh, you can kind of create a narrative out of this or a story if you will and let's bring these in and let's see maybe they go right there that's pretty cool let's maybe scoot this over all right, so I think we have the workings of a really cool still life. Um, and the reason I say that is because we have a lot of variety. Uh, the skull is really cool. It's got, you know, uh, great shapes in it. It's just kind of cool and, uh, and kind of gnarly looking. If you're gonna be working in color, it's nice to bring in, you know, a variety of color. We've got this little clay pot here that's got some nice warm reds and oranges and ochres, yellows. Uh, there's some cools in the uh, little tea box up front, particularly with the text and around it. Um, this little antelope guy, I really like its kind of spindliness, like the, the shape variation I think is also really important too. Um, and this little statue, uh, I certainly appreciate because it's, uh, it's really kind of like all about form. There's some like nice smooth shapes, there's a little bit more detail up in the hair, particularly down these folds too. And these folds even kind of play off the folds that you can make in your cloth. So we have a really cool still life now, but the lighting is kind of an issue. Uh, it works now, but I think we can make it a lot more fun, a lot more dynamic. So, um, what you need is a nice, clear, strong light source. And I happen to have this little clip light. I got this from Lowe's or Home Depot, only a couple dollars, uh, you know. And you can clip this to the side of your desk, you can put it up above. Uh, I like that it's got a clip so you can do a lot with it. I'm attaching it just to a little tabletop easel that I have pretty easy. And then I can bring this in and let's get this light on. All right. Now, the light source is cool, but let's get these overheads off and then we can really explore. Here we go. So nice strong light now. Uh, shadows, boom. As soon as you hit those lights off and this one's on, we have shadows. And uh, shadows are really, really important. Uh, they help, like, I mean, shadows really negotiate a lot of what we see. Uh, we use them to tell when objects are closer to another, far and away from each other. We use it to tell uh, how big they are, their volume. So all kinds of things uh, shadows really help with. And they also make a really, really excellent, uh, you know, kind of drawing source. So. Let's see, do we like this light now? I think it's pretty cool. Maybe it's focused a little bit too much here and we're losing a little bit of what's going on here. So rather than just hit the light and say, okay, I have light, 
move it around, see what you like. Like maybe that's too washed out or maybe like the shadows kind of get away from you if you move it around. So let's, let's see what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, all right, I think I like this. So now that we've got the light set up, we've got it just how we want, it's up to you to make this drawing. Um, in a still life like this, there's not a ton of objects, but there's still a lot here. So whether you choose to draw the entire thing, um, I say go for it. You spent the time to set it up, try to tackle the whole thing. Ah, but it's not just a one and done kind of deal. You can decide, okay, I really had fun drawing this whole thing, but maybe now I just want to focus on this pot and like how the things are related around it. Or I really like these flowers in this box. So maybe I'm just going to work on these. Uh, and you know, if you get one good drawing out of it, feel free to change things up. Maybe you take this out, bring it down a little closer, or maybe these kind of tuck in like this. If you're really interested in this now, you can make a bunch of little micro still lives out of one bigger still life. Um, you know, see what you can do and, and really play and explore options. I think this is a cool one. All right, so I'm going to hop back over and hit my lights and we'll get into our next section. So we've kind of gone over what makes a great still life, what makes a still life that could be a little bit better. Uh, so we have this here and I have two examples of a really cool still life and maybe one that could use a little bit of help or maybe not so much still life, but just observational drawing. So I have this drawing here. So you might recognize this little guy. So what I really like about this drawing uh, there's a lot of variation in its line. Uh, there's some nice contrast in it. There's a real strong sense of light. And I have the background here. Just this, this drop shadow over it and like how it kind of folds over the ripples of the cloth. This to me makes really exciting observational drawing and one that I'd love to see in a portfolio or if, uh, just the student's work in general. I also have an example of one that I think is still good but could use a little bit of help. So this drawing here, I do really like the line in it. Like I can tell that it was well observed. I can see like, you know, they're trying to find their ellipses. They're paying attention to the surface of things, uh, but it just kind of free floats on the page. So we're trying to avoid this idea of objects just float in space. You want to give them something to be grounded onto. Uh, and that's a pretty good tip. Um, it can be enough to like really get in and, and love that object, but if you give it something to sit on, you give it a place to be, uh, it really grounds the piece and it shows that you're paying attention to more than just that one object. All right. And so, uh, you know, kind of bringing it all back around, when it comes to observational drawing, I like to do a little checklist in my head uh, when I'm getting things set up. Um, I like to make sure that my, like, uh, my objects are interesting. Uh, do I have too many or do I need one or two more? Uh, lighting, do I have a good source of light or is it too washed out? and uh, with light comes shadows. Are my shadows interesting? Are my shadows too much? Are they too heavy? Are they uh, maybe just not exactly where they need to be so I have to adjust my light? And uh, to me, that's a pretty solid checklist when it comes to observational drawing. Uh, so you can go through all the effort of setting up the work. You can make a beautiful drawing or painting uh, and then it comes time to document it. And so making a clean photo of your work is really important. You know, get a tripod if you, uh, if you have access to one, or, you know, our phones do so much now. If you can get in really nice and close, take a clean shot, and then you might need to do a little bit of editing. You know, take it into your editor, increase the brightness, give it a little bit more contrast if the photo feels a little washed out. Make sure your fingers aren't in it or any, like, other objects that you don't want us to be paying attention to, uh, and just crop them out. And, uh, you know, really treat yourself well with that. A good photo goes a long way, because you can use it for portfolio submission, you can use it for you know, a website you can put on your social media. Uh, a good photo of a really nice drawing will pay you again and again and again. Uh, so, yeah, I hope this was really helpful for you. I had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, yeah, observational drawing, it's a lot of fun. <laughs>